Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take a moment to devote to worship today. Uh, there will be some announcements to be made tomorrow, Sunday, as some decisions have to be made about what goes on in the coming weeks in the life of the church. Uh, as you probably know, uh, this is a uh, a hard time right now in, in Missouri and across the country. And so we're, we're grappling with what's, what's the winter going to look like, especially as we're hearing about hospitals reaching capacity under this uh, the weight of this pandemic as numbers continue to go up. I do know that this week on Thanksgiving, on Thursday, this church will provide meals from 11 to 1230, delivery, or take out, come to the fellowship hall during that time, or uh, if you call the church between now and then, let us know how many meals you need and, and an address and we will drop them off. And, and we are gonna be preparing those meals. Everyone involved will be uh, socially distanced from each other with gloves and masks, taking every precaution that we can take so that uh, we are keeping the people we are serving safe and keeping each other safe. So I know we will have, that event will happen, and, and the rest, um, we'll, we'll be making some decisions in the next day or so. I believe it was at a visitation that I was talking to my friend Joe Hall. It was a moment after someone in the church had died, and she was telling me about her family, how she had been there for the death of her father and how her father had struggled as he lay there uh, in what was to be his, his deathbed. And he struggled, but then uh, Joe started singing uh, hymns. And while she sang, her father found peace. And then shortly thereafter, when her father died, a cardinal landed right outside the window and started singing to Joe. And... Uh, that, that was a moment of peace for her. She knew that her father was all right, sitting there listening to the Cardinal. A few years later, she was sitting by her mother's side, and as her mother slowly faded again, again she, she sang. And she, as she was sitting there singing, there was a, a solitary Cardinal sitting outside the window. And Right after her mother passed, another cardinal came and flew down to join the, the first cardinal. And for her, that was this, this moment that uh, she knew that uh, her parents were okay, that God was as close to her as those cardinals, and she would be sustained by the beauty of the songs of our faith. And that... Uh, it was an amazing story to hear, and I'm so honored to hear it. And for Jo, uh, she saw beauty in those around her. She saw beauty in service to those who she served. She uh, taught for a career as a special ed teacher in Green City, Missouri. And uh, as she retired from teaching, I had the privilege of sitting down with her and eating lunch and, and chatting with her about what, what was next. And when you retire, when you're in your 50s, and there's still a lot you can do. There's decades of time ahead of you. And Joe, what, what's next for you? Like, what would, what would make God smile to watch you do? What would be beautiful? And, and we talked about that, what she would do for her community. We talked about her dreams. And, um, and many of those did not come to pass. For last week, last weekend, Joe Hall died. She was intubated, and she was at Boone Hospital. And she died at age 64. And it is heartbreaking not just for her family and her church, but for her entire community. I have a feeling that uh, I know what her church will be singing this Sunday. For every Sunday, the last hymn was always the, the I was the pastor up at Green City for seven years. And on Sundays, the last hymn was always like your choice. Whoever wanted to sing, call out your favorite hymn and we'll sing it. And Joe always asked for, it is well with my soul. And I have a feeling I know what they will be singing this Sunday. And uh, at the churches I serve this Sunday, we will be singing that as well. Though I must confess, I might need others to help me sing it because I don't know if I can. 
Today, Green City weeps after Joe's passing. Milan, just to the west, last time I checked, uh, Milan's the county seat, has a small rural hospital, and it has the highest rate of infection per 100 people uh, in, in, this, in the state of Missouri right now. And as I look around the state, I have friends who have or are recovering from COVID in Kirksville, in Brookfield, in Palmyra. I have a friend down to the south in Springfield who is recovering from COVID. As I was writing this, I found out about another friend who's a chaplain to a hospital in the middle of the state who has been diagnosed with COVID. And it is particularly heartbreaking for her as she is a foster parent of an infant uh, who she has just been entrusted with the care of. Another friend of mine who works at William Wood University uh, is also on the on the tail end of recovering from COVID and talking to her, she was telling me about the, the fear of um, when she got a positive test result back, she had eaten lunch with her parents just recently. And, and what the fear and the, the being scared that what if she had passed this to her parents. In town after town, people that I know are infected with COVID and suffering from it. Some of the people I know are dying. This goes out to as far away as I know people. Right? As I listen to the news, I hear that we have a million more cases in America in a week. It took from February, March, till about a week and a half ago to, to get to 10 million cases. And then in a week, we went from 10 million to 11 million. That's my understanding of the numbers. Um, but like, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around what a million people is. But, but what I can wrap my mind around is that right now, everywhere that I have friends, one of my friends has COVID. There is nowhere I can go where one of my friends is not suffering with this. This is truly an inflection point for us as a community and as a nation. While this is a new situation in our lifetime, it is not a new situation across history. This has happened before, and it's happened long enough ago that there is specific guidance about how to respond to infectious diseases in one of the oldest books in the Bible. If you go to Leviticus, that book that people read all the time, I know, but it's in Leviticus. Leviticus 13, there are guidelines on how do we protect our community when we are dealing with infectious diseases. You can go through and read it. It says, just the first verse or two, uh, the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a bright spot on his skin that may become an infectious skin disease. All right? it's, not, you can, it's not that you can prove it, but if you have something that might be infectious, he must be brought to Aaron, the priest, or one of his sons who is priest, and they are to examine that person. And, and then it goes on to explain how, how that is handled, and the protocols for how it is handled in Scripture uh, are not exactly what we recommend today. We, things have changed a bit in, in the millennia since that was written. In the millennia since that was the best guidance that God, that it's not that it was the best offense that best guidance that God could offer. It is the best, it was the best guidance that the people could understand, if that makes sense. That, that distinction. But it's talking about how do you handle when people have infectious diseases. And the term used in Leviticus 13 was leprosy. Now, when we say leprosy today, we mean a very specific infection of a very one, one disease. And that's not how it was viewed back then. Leprosy today is one disease. Leprosy back then, that, the term that is translated as leprosy was a broad term that would refer to infectious disease in general that you could see on a person or on cloth or in a house. 
right? Anything that could be spread like that. And so there was guidance, right? If it wasn't just if he was a person, if you had a person, if you were if you were potentially infectious, you would get you would isolate yourself from the community, scrub yourself down by the river, come in and get inspect, inspected by the priest to see if you were still potentially infectious. You could also have clothing, right? If your clothing had leprosy, it would be put out in the sun, and if it spread, you had to burn it, and if it didn't spread, you could cut that patch out and resume using it. Your house could have leprosy. If a, pe a part of your the wall of your house was, uh, was growing something funky looking, right? you'd tear out that chunk of the wall, and then you would move out for a week, and you'd go back and you'd say, is it getting worse or not? And then you would go from there. And so the leprosy, the term, it was ref rashes, molds, like that sounds like how we would treat black mold in a house today, or, or if something was growing on the clothing, right? You wouldn't want to put something on to wear if it was funky and growing something. So there are best practices that are described in Leviticus 13 to keep the people healthy. It is what God gave to God's people to do to protect and take care of each other, to love our neighbors, right? It's not fun. It's not something that was enjoyable. It's not something I'm sure you've ever heard preached on before. Uh, but it was part of living together as a community. There was no moral evaluation or judgment that you are a bad person because you are sick. It was, you're sick, let's make sure that you can get better. It was something to handle. And that's how it was approached, right? That's how it was taught. It's just something to handle. It is just, it's simple. Just, it's simple, right? Follow health guidelines for the public good. Simple things to do. Except sometimes it's not so simple, is it? Sometimes it is anything but simple. Thinking about how this can unfold, let me tell you the story of Naaman. Naaman was a general in the Aramean army. He was a, a, rather, a general of high rank. Aramea was the land of the northeast of Israel, and they had fought between Israel and Aramea, and uh, they, they weren't fighting at this point, but uh, Naaman became sick with what the Bible tells us is leprosy. We don't know exactly what flavor of leprosy, but he's sick. Right? And so his wife's servant someone who had been captured in a raid on Israel, an Israelite lady, tells him, if you will go to Israel, there is a prophet there, and he will tell you how you are to be healed. Right? She knew. She knew Leviticus 13. She knew, like, they know how to handle being sick there. They know what you need to do. And so he goes. He gathers a long train of all of his, his, his the, peop, the men at his command. He brings gifts to bring. He brings a letter of introduction from uh, the, his king to go to the king of Israel. This all unfolds in, in 2 Kings 5, if you want to read the full story. It's a, it's a great story. 2 Kings 5 is where you find it. But he, he takes all the trappings of his station, the robes, the, the, all everything that makes him look so very impressive, and, and he goes and he is introduced introduced at the court of the king. And the king reads the letter and goes, oh man, eek! he's scared. He doesn't want, he sees this as a potential provocation that like the king of Aramea is sending this and, and there's sort of an implied, now if you don't heal my general, I'm going to invade because you have disrespected us. And, and so the king doesn't want to know, doesn't know what to do. And, and a messenger shows up from the prophet, Elisha, and says, send him to me. I'll take care of it. And so the, the general packs up everything and goes out and, and he stops in front of the house of Elisha. And he is expecting the prophet to come out and do something grand and important and like big deal, right? He has shown up in all of his glory. He expects the prophet to come out in all of his, his glory and, and, and the prophet doesn't. The prophet sends out a servant and says, go wash in the river seven times. Jordan River, just over there. And the, the general Naaman is furious. Like, he is furious. He has, like, 
packed up his life and brought all, everything that's important to him, and he is here in his full dress, and, and he is here as a dignitary of a foreign nation, and the prophet is sending out a servant to greet him? He has been intensely disrespected, right? This is an insult that could bring nations to war. This is what the king of Israel was worried about, right? This is an insult that could bring nations to war. And, and so Naaman is furious. Why should he go and cleanse himself in that lousy river? I've got rivers at home I can cleanse myself in. He just starts ranting to his people. And, and finally, one of the servants gets the word in edgewise. And he says to them, if the prophet had told you to do something hard, you would have done it. So why not try something simple? Is it, is it worth trying? And eventually, Naaman does. Gets down to the river, scrubs himself down seven times, and that's what leads to him being healed. Naaman, for me, is an example of when doing what is simple is deceptively hard. It is indeed simple for him to do what he has been told. Just go clean yourself. That's what the Jewish people know about public health. That's what the prophet told you. Go clean yourself, right? But it's not actually about getting in the water. This, in the sense, the servants were right, right? You were told to do something simple, just do it. But in, a, in another way, the servants were completely wrong. The servants were telling them, you know, just, just go do it. It's simple. It's not that big of a deal. But it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. It's not what he was told to do. It was who told him to do it. Here he is, an Aramean general who has come in to a foreign nation, a nation that they have been at war at, and we know they've been at war at recently because he has a captured slave, a captured servant that is Israelite, right? So we know that in his lifetime they have been at war with each other. So he has come into the land that at one point he has conquered or at least fought victoriously in, and he is asking for help. And he is not being treated with the decorum and the majesty as someone who could call up the army and come in and, and raise the place and destroy it. He is being treated as just another person. You know, you're sick just like anyone else is sick. Go wash yourself in the river. That's how we handle that here. Right? So he is being told what to do by an Israelite prophet, and he is not being treated with decorum or majesty. At that moment, when he is choosing whether to get in the water or not, it might be that he was playing out, how is this going to work out when he goes back home? When he goes back home, what's going to be worse? To go back and say, and still be sick? And be able to tell everyone, yeah, the Israelites really didn't know what they were doing. Because you know all of his friends knew what he was doing, right? When you gather that much finery and you tell the king, like, it would have been known. Is it, which is worse, right? To go back and, and still be sick and to tell everyone that the Israelites really ended up not knowing what they were doing or to go back and go back healthy but have to explain how he has been treated. Well, what one's going to be worse, right? Would it be better just to go back sick and be able to maintain his superiority as an Arab man that has conquered Israelites? Oh, or does he admit that he submitted to being treated like just another person? By being, he's told what to do by an Israelite, Israelite prophet, and he was treated just like just another person, and that's what he did. In the end, he picks that he will do what is simple, though it is very hard. He picks following the Israelite gu guidance, and he is, he is healed. And I don't know which is more of the miracle, that he was healed, or that he was willing to do it. We, today, are in a similarly put-together situation. All right? Leviticus lays out the best practice for the time with regards to public health. And today, we have 
the best we have we know what the best practices are with regards to public health public approaches that are working in other parts of the world a friend of mine in the fountain pen community the online fountain pen community yep it's kind of an odd thing i admit but just roll with me for a minute right there's a guy i know who is a nurse in australia and he told me today that when he goes to work right now, the only place they have to wear masks are in the emergency room and where they're treating the few COVID patients they have because otherwise, they're just not having to wear masks or deal with it because for the most part for them, life is back to normal, right? This approach to public health, it works. It is working. It has worked in other places around the world. It's, it's, it's simple, right? Naaman just needs to get in the water. We just need to wear a mask and stay distant from each other. For Naaman to get in the water and for us as a community to be willing to put masks on, these are very simple things to do. But they, yes, they are very hard. Why? Well, we know. Right? For Naaman, it, it was the, who told him what he had to do. Right? For him, an Aramean general, to be told what to do by an Israelite prophet, like, that, that was really hard for him. For us today, it, it's, a, it's a similar situation. Like, we don't like to be told what to do. It's part of the, the American culture. We don't like being told what to do. Right? I find it darkly amusing that when we comes to when, when you want to read about scripture, what about what the Bible says about infectious diseases? That it it echoes how things are today. There is a chapter in Leviticus 13 that talks about the dry practices of public health that read as just as dry of a fashion as reading guidelines for contact tracing and mask and social distancing today. It's boring, and yet it's a matter of life and death. And also the other moment in scripture that talks about an infectious disease is talking about a guy who has been told what he needs to do but really doesn't want to do it. Right? That's, <laughs> it's kind of fitting. It seems to be that this is going to be our theme for a while though. Right? That we're going to live in this moment between dry descriptions of how to live in a time of illness that sound simple in the abstract but are rather challenging to follow, and how that intersects with, with the nature of, of will people do this? Will people do this? And I don't think that right now it's going to get any simpler or clearer or cleaner that people are across America are en masse going to say, ah, you're right, we should all just wear masks now. But that's what it is. A bunch of people, or just a, America is just a bunch of people, right? In, at, at its core, America is a group of individuals, and we are all facing the decision that Naaman faced. Get in the water or not. Wear a mask or not. Now, this Sunday, today, this, this Sunday, uh, this Sunday before Thanksgiving, it is entirely possible that this is going to be the last Sunday that is in person this year. I'm going to watch the numbers in the coming days, and we're going to see what happens. But it's, we're, we're that close to be having just to shut everything down through December. And so what I'll be telling my churches, and what I will tell anyone watching today, I don't want to do your funeral. I don't want to hear about your funeral being held. And it could happen. I don't expect it to. I don't plan to. But I sure didn't expect to be looking up my notes on Joe Hall's favorite music and hymns so I could send to the pastor who followed me so that he could do her funeral and do it well. I ask you to please take Leviticus 13 seriously. It is a guidance on how we follow public health policy. That doesn't mean you need to go to Leviticus 13 and start doing exactly what it says, but it does mean we need to look at Leviticus 13 and see how it fits into the context of how God's people are told to take care of each other in moments when there is a public health challenge, when there is a sickness that could be infectious. And so this is a moment 
when we need to listen to the wisdom of such organizations of the AMA, the American Medical Association, the CDC, listen to our local hospitals. They're running out of beds. And if they're not running out of beds, they're running out of nurses to take care of people in those beds. I wish that more people could learn the lesson of Naaman and just get in the water. I know it's hard and I hope people will do it anyways. For us, it's not about getting in the water. It's about being willing to wear a mask when we're around others, being able to, being willing to stay six foot distant from each other and not travel during this holiday season. And it's not that we don't travel because we don't love our family. It's that we don't travel so that we'll be able to go and see them next year, right? Finally, please remember that while these discussions may be simple, they can be very hard. I have seen insulting people, insulting intelligence. I've seen people questioning the faith of others. If you really believed, you wouldn't. God will protect you. No, God told us Leviticus 13. Uh, we have our, our guidance here, right? Uh, I have seen guilt and shames and shaming and accusations in person and on Facebook. And, and think of Naaman, right? If we're asking someone to do this and they're, they're not doing it already, it's not... It's not an easy decision. I respect anyone who is willing to do it, and I'm thankful that you do. In the end, we are all gathering to follow the same Lord, headed towards the same kingdom. And on the other side of this seemingly never-ending pandemic, we're still going to be family. We may walk apart for this time, but we're still family. And so I, I ask that we might love each other through this, doing what is simple, masking, distancing, doing it even when it is hard, doing it out of love for neighbor, because that's what God's people do. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we enter the holiday season, a time that is thick with traditions and expectations, comfortable moments of joy and the important gatherings that bind together families and communities. We pray that each of us and those we love might, like Naaman, do what is simple, even when it is hard. That we might be able to follow advice that was first given by you long ago and continues to be how we love neighbors, even in the midst of this disease that threatens us, as so many diseases have threatened us over time and as we've gotten through them. We pray that we might get through this. In your name we pray. Amen. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.